going to welcome the boys. Welcome Andy Flute, please. Come on, Andy Flute. Yeah. Yeah. British boxing ca uh, captain, professional boxer. He looks mean, don't he? Yeah. Jay Astley, come on, Jay Astley. Yeah. Professional bodyguard, doorman. Mark Fellows, come on. Hey. Dorman, 15 years, five years of professional bodyguard as well, so, okay. They're going to do the best to tell their story in their own words with no prompting from me. Uh, we are streaming uh, on Facebook Live and it will go on YouTube a little bit later on, so thank you guys for your honesty. And uh, People often blame their childhood for how they turn out, so just tell us a little bit, Andy, about what it was like being brought up by your mum and dad and what being a kid was like in Cosley? Um, I had a great childhood, to be honest. Um, I was always a bit of a rebel, but I had a great childhood. I never liked going to school, but um, I had a fantastic mum and dad, fa fantastic childhood. Um, my dad was a scrap man. We got horses, we got all sorts. You know, all the kids used to go out on their bike. I'd go out on my horse, you know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and just, it was just great, great growing up. Um, and then, like, my dad was a boxer himself, and he took me to the gyms and stuff, and that's where I started to learn stuff. But my childhood was was really good, to be honest. I was happy that apart from going to school, I used to like to go to work with my dad instead. You know, my dad used to get, give me jobs to do, or sit in the crane, or drive, you know, sit in the lorry, or so. You know, I remember sitting in the lorry once. In the drive, and I took the handbrake off and rolled across the road and knocked, and knocked the, the wall over in the, uh, across the road, you know. But, um, you know, my childhood was fabulous, to be honest. You so know, good, good days, then. Good great days, days to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mark, how about you? Um, with my parents, yeah, it was good. I, I didn't see my dad very often, he was a steel worker and he used to work away abroad. and uh, he helped build the Thames Barrier, which I'm very proud of. Um, so it was mainly me and mum. Um, and that was good. Outside of the family home, uh, well, believe it or not, there was a little bit of bully st bullying started at junior school. I was only like, you know, so like it, I, I discovered that if I give him a slap, then he wouldn't come by me anymore. So I did, you know. And then I discovered after I'd done that that my friends wouldn't come by me either. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it was good, yeah. It, it, it was good. It's, it, the things that I believe in today were my mum and dad didn't force nothing on me. I believe the same what they believe, I believe. Um, but I was an atheist all my life, all my life, before yeah. I walked in this building. So, great upbringing then. You've talked often to me about your mum and how kind she's been to you. So, Jay, obviously your story might be a little bit different, I'm sure. So. Um, I grew up in, um, on the wren's nest. <laughs> so, <laughs> I learned how to tarmac and how to pinch your car. <laughs> okay. So, my um, upbringing was good, to be honest. Um, my mum was lovely. My dad was very, very strict. The belt would come out quite often because I was a bit of a rebel. Which made me quite shy. Um, it also made me quite hard, quite tough. Because my dad was a big guy with big muscles and when he eat with the belt, he eat with the belt, you knew by. Sometimes I've done things worse, I got worse in the belt, but that's the way it is. Um, I had a great life at school. I became very, very clever at school. I love going to school because it's my escape from being naughty. Um, I was never naughty at school, I was just naughty at home. Um, so I've become very clever, which you probably call tell look at me today, you know. <laughs> it's not my fault me head old girl, you know. Anyway, um, what I want to say to you about this, this, this little subject is everybody in this church, you're probably all carrying something from your childhood, you know. They'll carry you. Don't carry it. I'd have to go up and be using my hands and belts and sticks and, I'll be honest with you, guns and whatever I've used in the past. But I did. So whatever you're carrying with you, 
what was put on you as a kid, to not get rid of it. Get rid of it. So if you become a little bit of a bully because you've been bullied, stop it. Stop it. You know, break that chain like we were just singing about. Don't be a bully because you've been bullied. You know, if something bad's happened to you, it's time to forget about it. Because if somebody's done something bad to you, from a woman's point of view, the most horrible thing in the world, I'm not even going to say, just forget about it. I know it's difficult. It's not easy. I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not easy for me to forget all the pain growing up as being bullied and being having a good eye off my dad who was big and strong. But listen, I love my dad. I forgive him. I forgive him. He never really did anything wrong anyway. I was just a bit of a naughty kid, so I got the belt. You know? Now, I, I, don't, I don't hurt the kids. Leah will tell you. Leah's a gaffer now. That's not me. I'm a... My little girl will tell you. You know, Mia. <laughs> Mia will tell you that has, has got me right on the little finger. So I broke the chain. So if there's anything you pass us haunting you, when you walk out the door, leave it there. That's good. Leave thanks, it there. Thanks, George, for that. Thank well done, Joe. Obviously, life went on for you, Andy, and um, you became a professional boxer, and uh, you went from being a cosy lad to rubbing shoulders with some of the rich and famous of the sporting world. Just, just tell us a little bit about that part of the story. Um, well, really, I started from the bottom, to be honest. Um, you know, like every, you know, just get to be able to just get mixed with them sort of people. Um, you have to put a lot of training, a lot of dedication. Um, anybody knows what's what it's like. You know, to do anything, you only get out what you put in. To be honest, um, it's all thanks to my dad. To be honest, but I, I really did work hard. On a day like you know, I, you know, I, everything I put my heart and soul into, I, I put it into pop boxing. To be honest, and I went through my, all my all my amateur career from the age of eleven. Up until like I was 30, then I, I'd have a year off. To be honest, I boxed that many times. I had over 100 fights and won like just th about, just over three quarters of them. Um, you know, so it was quite good. To be honest, I boxed world championship level as amateur and as a professional. You know, which is quite an achievement. Um, I could have gone on to greater things, but you know, it, it was meant to be. To be honest, I like the taste of. The, drinking and everything else and the lifestyle. I had loads of opportunities. Um, you know, I signed I signed with Matchroom, um, Eddie Hearn's dad, you know, Barry Hearn for Matchroom. I signed with him. He couldn't understand why. You know, he, he said to me, I'll make, make you the next world champion. He said to me, Dad, what I call, you know, but I, I just kept going out drinking and putting stuff in my body and everything else. But, you know, it's gone by now. I don't, I don't, I don't you know, I don't, I don't regret what I did because I wouldn't be like I am today, to be honest. But um, it was great. I loved rubbing shoulders with all them people. It was tough, you know, boxing with Chris Eubank, Joe Kalzaki, um, Nigel Ben was tough. You know, all them sort of people, even the, when I used to go sparring in Germany, you know, they was tough. They was world champions. And I fought everybody on the way up, on the way up. Uh, even if, see, you, you can have a great boxing record, if you, but it depends who you fight. And all the names on my record, was either world champions or fighting for world champions or going to be even the British title. When I fought for the British title, the bloke was a world class bloke who went on to fight for the world title. I mean, the British titles now, today, they ain't nothing, to be honest. You know, but you know, I mean, if it was about today, it would have been easy. But at that error as well, you've got like Nigel Ben, Chris Eubank, Joe Kalzaki, there was that big error of, of, of fighters. And I could hold my own with all of them, no problem, e easy. And I used to drink every night as well. You know, I used to drink, I used to spar with these blokes and fight with these blokes. And I never, you know, I never turned a job down or I never turned nothing down. Any job what came up or it's who against or who anything, I, I just took it. I don't care. I was totally fearless of anybody or any boxer or anything, you know, and, and <clears throat> that, carried, that carried me good, good stead. And mixing with these world champions was, was great. I loved it, going to all the, you know, the big fights and all the things and all the razzmatazz, what goes with it and all the stuff. But I also like party lifestyle, to be honest. <clears throat> and that was my downfall. But uh, it was great, to be honest. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah well, you're renowned around here. Every time I go anywhere, they say, Flutie. You don't, you don't come to church, does he? I say, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Brill. Um, obviously, Jay, your story is the end different to Andy's. And uh, how did your journey into sort of security work, maybe other stuff that you want to talk about, happen? Because, you know, life got a little bit... Difficult for you, didn't it, at points? Yeah. Um, before I go on, if you look at my nose, that proves Andy can punch. He did that to my nose. <laughs> I'm not even joking, neither. And Scott over there, eat me as well. 
Anyway, add him in the old. Oh, yo, you ain't hiding, mate. You're at my nose as well. But anyway, old. Now, I got into security by... by I, I was more into martial arts and football because I always thought football has got more women. That's what... That's, that's why they get boxed. That's the truth. But anyway, old. Um, when I was kickboxing, uh, the guy around the, the company also had a, had a gym. I was kickboxing at the gym. And he... he um, he asked me um, 16 years ago if I'd go and help him look after Ricky Hatt and just could drive. He couldn't drive, he couldn't drive to go and look after him. So I said, okay, I went. And today, oh, 16 years later, I'm the boss. I ain't got a clue, I've done that, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. But yeah, I, I just went, my life in security started because um, basically I could look after myself and a bad temper. I ended up also being, you got a club in Sydney called Monty's. And by another gang. We're my gang as well, you know, Christians. Don't think we are. We are. We're my gang. We just believe in something different. We're still a gang. You know? I'm guessing cute's made, but anyway. I was, um, I was an enforcer. I was enforced for the Hells Angels, so if somebody needed a slap, that's what I did. I'm not proud of it, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to hold nothing back. I was a pretty good fighter. Um, the one day they found me up and said, there's a guy in the red line. We need someone to come and kick him out. I said, who's that? He said, Andy Flute. I said, no. <laughs> I'm not joking. That is not a joke. Is this a joke, Leah? Leah knows that I'm not joking. They found me up. The Hells Angels found me up. Can you come to the red line? There's a guy in here. He's drunk. He's playing up and he's offering everybody out. We were all a little bit scared of him. I said, who is this? He Andy Flute. I'm not coming. <laughs> not a chance. No, I said, no, joking apart, I end up, end up in education, working for the old angels, working the doors, getting lamped, getting the lampings out. I've got a mate over there, Mario, who's he's probably the biggest guy in here, so you can't miss him with a big beard like mine. But I use just for many, though, anyway. He'll tell you, we've had some wide battles on the doors and stuff like that over the years. It ended up... It ended up doing me good because now apparently I'm supposed to be doing one of the top five bodyguards in the world. That ended up doing me good because now, now I found Jesus, I got peace, and I got power. <laughs> so I'll say it someday leave. If they don't leave, I'll drag them out and I'll pray for them when I go on my side. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very good, Jay. Very good. I, I, I just want to say this as an aside. All of these guys come to this church. You know, we haven't imported these in from anywhere. And uh, <laughs> Mark, yours is a bit of a different story because I know you're an intelligent guy. You love your reading. You were training to do law and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, what's your story? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah, uh, that was my dream. Um, and ended up on a club door somehow. But there was three of us. I, I, after I was bullied at school, I, I um, decided I was going to do some martial arts and different things like that and kickboxing and so so I didn't like it. So it, I didn't... I didn't uh, it was the gym. Um, and then three of us from school... We said, come on, let's do this. It was my idea. I'm not being big-headed, but it was my idea. And I, I found myself standing on Bournemouth Seafront uh, outside a, a club with Kenny Ball and his jazz men. And I was 18 years of age. Um, and it was an education. Uh, let's put it like that. It was an education. Um perks of the job, I didn't really want them, you know. I didn't drink then at the time. I was teetotal. <laughs> uh, Coca-Cola was the strongest thing I would drink, not Coke. Um, and, you know, I decided that when I got to 40, I thought, I have to look at this like I was a sportsman. I know when to pack it in. Now when my reflexes won't be as quick. When I when uh, it just won't be there anymore. And do I want it anymore? So when I that was what I did. And when I got to forty, I, I did five years working for somebody. 
I can't name names, but somebody, a uh, very rich person, and uh, it wouldn't have been worth me walking again if uh, I said who it was. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, I did that to set myself up to... I wanted a quiet life away from it all, and that, that was it, you know. I love partying, and, uh, yeah, I like partying too much. That's why I didn't end up being a lawyer. Great. Um, I don't want to paint uh, a picture that's not worth painting about your lives. And um, I know that you've had some struggles. All of you had some struggles. Um, we sit and laugh about it now, but there's been some hard, dark times. So, Andy, tell me about the battles outside the ring. How dark did it really get? How long have I got? <laughs> Just tell them, Andy. Yeah. Um, well... To start with, um, the biggest the biggest fight I had is like my uncle Colin told me. He says your biggest f fight is going to be the, against the, 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 the your alcohol, because no one sets out to become an alcoholic. It just creeps up on you, to be honest. And that was my biggest fight. I could handle everything else. Um, everything else was great. Um, I'd made it by the time I was thirty, you know. Um, and and but. S s Creeping up and creeping up was my alcoholism because I kept drinking and drinking slowly, you know. And, just, and the alcohol used to be um, a great release and it used to have a great time, but you know, and it was great. But as the years went on, as the years went on, I was slowly becoming um, an alcoholic, to be honest. Uh, but I don't know, you're always the last to know. <coughs> and then, Bosch, once alcohol stops being your friend and it's your worst enemy. I'm telling you, it's a terrible addiction. It's a terrible illness. Um, it strips you of everything and takes everything away from you and everybody and everything, to be honest. Um, and that's what happened to me, to be honest. Um, I battled everything, to be honest. I had to battle so many things, uh, battling my di divorce, not seeing my children. Um, I had to battle the tax man. I had to battle all sorts. While I was an alcoholic, and while you're an alcoholic, you could do nothing because your head's so messed up to be honest um, I went to prison many times so I went from being a local hero to being a local drunk to be honest um, and that was tough you know so you know but um, you know and I kept I kept trying not to not to you know I kept thinking well, you know try, trying to beat it myself you know um, but I couldn't I mean I, you know the, the, I could always out drink anybody and always stay out longer you know and just keep giving and it just gradually gradually got worse um, I got stabbed I got I broke my back uh, all sorts happened to me smashed my cars up lost my licenses um, I remember fall, falling over in my apartment um, knocking myself out off the toilet split my head open uh, with a big gash on me I'd lie there knocked out on the floor uh, Angela, my partner, just pat tried to patch me. It's good job as a doctor. Patched me, patched me head up the best I could. And as soon as I woke up and come round, I just went straight back out and uh, straight back out and started drinking again. That's how bad it was. And then I tried to take my own life because I couldn't cope with everything and uh, what I'd become and, and everything else what had happened to me. And then, so I took an overdose uh, while I was in drink and drugs and stuff. Um, and I woke up. If they had to p pump like the, the injection into me to stop it. I won't be here now to tell this story, to be honest. But and then what did I do? As soon as I got come out of the hospital, I just went straight back straight to the off license and got a drink. You know, I got that many. You know, that's that's how bad the addiction had got to me. I remember my dad locking him, locking me in my own house, um, taking my money off me, and because he was that worried and coming down to try and help me. And I jumped out the bedroom window to get out to get a drink with no shoes and socks on, just just to get out. And I had no money, but I knew I could get some from somewhere or to do something. You know, so, you know, it really, really was that, that bad for me, like, with addiction. I could, um, you know, it could, if it, sometimes if I was on a bender, I'd just, uh, if I was awake, I was drinking. And if I was asleep, I was drinking. It was that bad. And it was a matter of life and death for me, to be honest. Because, I, you know, it, that's how much it creeped up on me over the years. I'd just get like that. It creeped up slowly and slowly and slowly. And, um... <laughs> the, 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 and then there's, there was the drugs that went with the alcohol as well. You know what I mean? I could do a thousand pound of crack uh, easy in a, in a day while I was drinking. I mean, even the, even the people in the crack den couldn't believe how much drink and everything I was consuming. There was, there was just absolutely mortified that somebody like me was like like that. You know, 
and then all of a sudden things in tr trouble in, in, in prison. They locked me up in this one cell with this, what, this, this immigrant kid in his stunk. And I said, if you don't fucking get him out of my cell, I'm going to fucking lamp him and, and lamp the screws and everything. And they, 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 moved, they moved it me like, you know, because that, that's, that's, that's the sort of thing of God, the temper I had as well, you know what I mean? But, you know, the addiction side of alcoholism, I mean, some of my friends are from AA today, you know, and the AA really... Um, as well as everything else, just it's a great organisation and a great fellowship. And with the help of a few other people, I'd just like to thank John Crampton and if, for all his help, what he's doing and all the stuff. Because, you know, I really was that bad. You know, I really was an alcoholic of the worst, as the worst type. Um, as worse, and you know, there's that many stories I could tell you, drinking stories, you know, like drinking about 78 bottles of wine in two weeks when I counted them after, you know, and it's, you know, like, you know, 16 bottles of scotch in five days, stuff like that, sniffing vodka to just, to just get the eye, you know what I mean? It's, it was just that crazy. And like, you know, the things you, you used to do, I mean, I went to, I got locked up in the police station three weeks on the trot and the, and the copper in the police station, he used to box for my dad and he, and, and, and he couldn't believe it, to be honest. He could not believe it that somebody like me Somebody like me had fell down, got this low, you know, because of the addiction of alcohol. You know, I mean, it, it, it was that bad, to be honest. And I, and I got run over as well and all sorts of stuff. And, and, and on a day only, like, and that happened a couple of times. It was a few times, you know, because you think, when you first put that alcohol into you, you think, I'm only going to have a few. But little did I know that I was setting the addiction off, setting it off, setting, um, setting the craving off again. And off I'd go again on a merry-go-round of just just absolute hell, to be honest. And I was in hell, really was in hell, to be honest. Um, and that's how bad it was. And anybody who knows anybody with any sort of, of addiction or any or alcoholic or anybody, if, you know, people think you've got a, a drink problem, with, but, you know, if you am an alcoholic of the, of the type I was, that's how bad it was, to be honest, really bad. Going from an alcoholic, you know, to a drunk. And everybody moving away, away from me when the city come in and yeah. just crossing over. Mm. So it was that bad, yeah. to be honest. Just hold that thought there. You were in hell. I was in hell. Right, we're going to forgive you for the watershed moment, OK? <laughs> <laughs> but only because we love you. Jay, you tell us a little bit about how bad it got for you. Yeah? Uh, my addiction was... It started out with dancing. It's after the sounds. I used to be a really good dancer. So I went to a rave, and you called Dance All Night on Cider. So, you got it, mate. I was taking, like, it got to the stage where I was taking 10, 15 ecstasy pills a night, probably three or four grams of coke, and a bit of speed to top it off. I'd go out on a Friday, come back on a Monday. A dictionary funny, it's not... It's not, well, on the past, I'm telling you, it's not who, who, who is addicted. There could be anything. It ranges from alcohol, even to sex. You can have a secret addiction to stuff like that. My advice to you all is, seek some help. Yeah, the doctors are brilliant. Replace it with someone. To beat my addiction, I started loving people. My sisters are here tonight, my cousins here, Phil, tonight. My niece, nephews, and my daughter. Stepdaughter, but I always call her my daughter. Is If you've got any addictions, replace it with something. For me, it was the gym. The gym. And a bit further down the line, it, it, it became Jesus. When I, found, when I found Jesus, I was struggling. I was struggling with aggression, which is another addiction. I like punching people in the face. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm doing my best not to swear. I really am, because it's, you know, because it's, that, that's the way it is. You know, we're, good, we're real. I'd say to you all, if there's anybody in way Christian tonight, you know, there's nothing wrong with being real. You ain't got to come through these doors of this church and say, oh, I've got to be a good little boy now, put a suit on, I've got to calm me in. No, get out of here. Come on, man. That's not, not, that's not what Jesus is about, you know? And I oh, know for a fact, 100%. When I found Jesus, that was it. That was it for me. A door opened. Addictions 
gone. Up to last week, the people in church now are still doing a bit of this and doing a bit of that to help me train to keep up the young lads in the gym. I've stopped that. I suppose that was addiction, but it's addiction to the gym, not not to not all addictions are supposedly bad. My drug addiction was bad. Fluid addiction to alcohol was bad. You know, led us down bad paths. But like I said, what I want to say to you is when I found Jesus, something different, something happened. And I'll be honest with you, I won't even look for Jesus. I'll, I'll tell you after the next question what happened to me, but if you've got any addictions, mm. replace them. Don't just don't think you can beat it and just carry on with your life as it was before, because you can't. You can't. Once you're addicted, you're addicted for, for life. If I go out my mates on the stag do or anything, the powder comes out, I walk away. I can't stay there. Because if they're all doing it, guess what? I'm going to do it. I'm not stupid enough to say I'm not going to do it. I am. So I walk away. I walk away from things like that. Addiction is real. And if you know anybody's addicted, please do not put them down. That's the last thing they need. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Mark was just telling me in the car park. He, I've known him, know Mark, just under 12 months. He was just telling me in the car park. He didn't even tell his own mum, but you had six months, didn't you? Six months to live. Just six months, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it was drink and drugs. Um, and steroids at the gym, legal and illegal steroids. Um, that was bushy fields. Was six months. Yeah, um, I went. I, I tried drugs right back to to the seventies, LSD, Purple Arts, right through to the present day, Mamba. Uh, I'm not proud to say I've tried them all. And I, I know why I did it, because I thought, I looked at it like this. I went in a restaurant, I thought, well, how do I know what I like? I'll try everything. So I did. That was what I did. I know what, and then from there, I know what I like and what I didn't like. I was drinking at my height 56 cans a week of um, uh, skull super through a straw. Uh, which equates at eight cans a day, uh, and that was just to feel how I feel now, um, with drugs, prescribed and illegal drugs. Um, <clears throat> what I discovered, because I wanted to see what was really wrong with me, was the, the chemical imbalance in my head, which is mental illness, which I suffer from, um, is then aggravated by prescribed drugs which are given to you to help you but you got the side effects from them and then you times that with um, drugs and alcohol those three all together for 22 years is a pretty lethal combination and um, I always felt that I knew how to handle it I didn't know I was addicted no no, but I knew I had an addictive personality. My mum told me, my dad had. But then he only smoked, and I thought, well, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, definitely an addictive... I believe in that, an addictive personality. Um, now, the drink pff, doesn't interest me. I can say October the 9th last year was my last drink of alcohol. Um <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I have to say, when I tried, I, I, the last can of beer I had, um, I actually spit it out because I found it repulsive, which the medication I'm on is supposed to do that. Uh, there's other medications that make you sick, but this isn't that one. This one is to make it repulsive. But... If you don't have your medication, which I come here this morning to service and suddenly realised I got the shakes and I couldn't work out why. I thought, no, I don't have the shakes for not having a drink now. I have them from not having my tablets. And I suddenly thought, I hadn't took my tablets, see? And that's how it was telling me. I'll always be an alcoholic in the respect of, 
you know, just that I don't drink. But when somebody comes up to you and tells you that um, you, your liver is, well, it's six months. The only good thing about the liver is it's, it's self-repairing, but it will always be scarred for life, of course. I deserve that. I did it. Nobody forced it on me whatsoever. Um, but, you know, I would drink from six o'clock in the morning, six o'clock. I didn't drink tea, coffee, anything else at all. And I would drink until, what, three, four in the morning when I went to bed. I've got two fridges, beer fridges, everything around the house, um, you know, um, uh, enough drugs and whatever to open Cynthia Payne's brothel. Um, you know... Um, <laughs> Another watershed moment there. Really. <laughs> See, we're trying to be real, you oh, know, God, what, what, what God has done for these boys, you know, this, that we're all a work in progress and uh, we need to understand that and uh, we want to be a real church where, where people can come and find a peace and a joy and uh, what these guys have been through collectively is quite astounding. Um, you probably kept the illegal drug trade in going for a long, long time between you. Know, so. um, the great news is you're sitting here tonight and you've got a new story to tell. Um, when we got to you, Andy, me and John at the back, it wasn't looking good, was it? No, not at all, to be honest. Um, I've been on a binge, um, and uh, I don't know what else to do, to be honest. And, um, <clears throat> it was a matter of life and death, to be honest. Um, and Angela phoned John, my mate, John Crampton and Steve, and they come and prayed for me at the house, to be honest. Um, I was a near-death experience. To, um, I, was, I, was, I was gone. I was, I was just that, that bad, to be honest. Um, because that's... Well, on the journey, alcohol took me because I could not stop drinking till I physically, physically couldn't take another drink. And then, I mean, I remember once being sick, being sick, and I hadn't got much drink left, and I was sicked it in a glass so I could drink it again. You know what I mean? And, and 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 drinking, I even I even drunk a bottle of mouthwash once because it said there was a little bit of alcohol in it. Do you know what I mean? That that that's how bad it was, you know. And um, <clears throat> to be relieved of that, to be took away, you know. So you know, <coughs> Stephen, <coughs> Stephen, John, come and um, <coughs> John blow the show for on, and just it was just absolutely amazing to be honest. And I look back since to be honest, you know. <laughs> I mean so. But um, yeah. yeah, I was really in a bad place. But that happened. That happened a few times before I could reach out, you know, and, and ask for help. To be honest, you know. And that night you reached out to Jesus, didn't you? Uh, what is what we, when we got there? I, I have never probably seen anything like it in my life. As we we went up uh, the stairs, uh, John and I felt this sense of foreboding, and there was a almost like a dark cloud hanging over your bed. And to be honest, we knew that you were going to die. And uh, John got a ram's horn, which. Something they blow in the Bible, yeah, the show for, yeah. yeah. You weren't very happy then. I think you used some watershed words then. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few. And, um, and he told us to go away, didn't he? In a very pretty way. And, uh, but it wasn't very long, just, just a few, few moments, hours. You were up and you were sober. And, I uh, felt better straight. I wasn't sober, but I felt better straight away after you'd after you prayed and left. To be honest, something changed in me, to be honest. Mm. And we baptised you in the tank down here? Well, how that come about? Because um, th I'd been coming to church on and off, and I'd been going to Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff. And I was, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, it tells you to get a power greater than yourself. And I thought, how can I get a power greater than me? I can fight anybody, do anything. And, and, and I, you know, I had a great big ego, big head, thought I could do anything, thought I was it and stuff. You know, but, you know, I, I was really brought down with a bang, to be honest, and I was I was begging for mercy on my hands and knees, begging for mercy. And and on a, my, my baptism was booked twelve days after John and Steve come. And um, I said to God, I said, God, if you're real, because I, I don't want to go through with the baptism because I was that ill. I was still I was, I've still got the shakes and I was still ill. And um, and I, I don't feel I don't want to go through with it because anybody knows who's coming off the drink. If it's in a bad way, that way you don't you don't want to see nobody or talk to anybody or do anything. You just, you just want to lock away, lock yourself away till you feel better. 
and that's all I could do. I mean, and that's all I could do. And a couple of my friends from AI was texting me and following me, and they were saying, Andy, every minute what's going by, you're getting better. You're getting better. Every, you know, it was the fellowship with these people. You know, it was absolutely fantastic as well. But I managed to sum, and I said to God, I said, God, I said, if I get through with this baptism, I said, will you take my alcoholism away? You know what? I mean, I found the strength, and I read like a letter to him. Do you know what I mean? To, to like, like you know, like to, to actually asking him if, if he, you know, I've had enough of this now. I can't take no more. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. He brought me to my knees. I was crying out for help. I just couldn't take no more. I really had had enough. And you know, I went through with the baptism, to be honest. And I, I just this ain't no make up, made up joke or anything or anything else. It's the best thing whatever happened to me in my life. You know what I mean? Really, 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 really. It's it was just a life changing experience. Forget all them big fights and forget everything being on the television and forget meeting all things. The baptism was the best thing of ever what's ever happened to me in my life. And I hate just saying that. I've, my life changed so much since that baptism. Took all that anger away, took all that thing away, took me compulsed to drink. I ain't wanted to drink since. You know what I mean? And I know yeah. Yeah. And that, 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 that is really the truth. To be relieved of alcoholism is better than anything because once you've got that killer, in, killer illness, you know, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's, it, and see, people don't really see it as an illness, but it really is. Mm. And, and th there's, no, there's no way here because you always you, you keep going back to it and keep going back to it. You know what I mean? Out of, out of, out of, out of, about 100 alcoholics, only three of them make it, to be honest. You know what I mean? That's the, like the statistics. But um, to be absolutely relieved of that and what John and Steve and actually finding this church and everything else, it just, it just gave me a new life. And yeah. I can't thank, thank, thank you enough, and Steve and John. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's great, Andy. And uh, the baptism, when we, when we open up the tank and we do a baptismal, it's just people declaring their faith to say, look, I, I need something beyond myself, which is what Andy said. And uh, Jesus has come into his life and made all the difference. That am for you, Jay, but not probably in the same kind of way, did he? Um, when I found Jesus, I was probably well on the way to getting life in prison. I was a big, nasty, full of this, full of that. Any drugs I could get, I'd take. You know, I was flying... Flying on anything all the time. I was in the gym. I was a bit of a bully in the gym. So if I was boxing with anybody, kickboxing with anybody, even weights, I'd bully I've got mates near who probably would have never ever realised, especially you, Lee, the amount of wars we've had. Lee, stand up, please, mate. Stand up. I've got a lot to thank this guy for. Cause honestly, we have had some serious... Serious punch ups in the gym. Proper punch ups to where the gaffer of the gym's coming and says, You two gonna get banned if you carry on. You know, one he's got to leave. So we're best mates. And we've got bloody nails and black eyes, you know. And we were bullies, were we like? We was in the way sometimes, we were bullies. So I'll get a job as a bodyguard. I'm looking after a guy, after guys called JLS in Birmingham. There's a big, massive crush, you might have saw on the news. Eight, nine years ago, and a little girl gets crushed. 14. Um, I'll pick up this fence with about 40, 50 people on. Now, if you can pick up a fence with 40, 50 people on, then carry on. Because I couldn't do it neither. It wasn't me. That girl wasn't meant to die. But she's dead in my arms. I run with her. Of all places, I took her to the hot dog stand and got some water. And then I went back and helped some more kids and went back and took her to an ambulance because in a bad way. Um, the ambulance took her off. I went back. The place looked like a bomb site. There's bags and shoes and kids stuff all over the place. There's 12,000 kids and about probably 400 of them got crushed. But lo and behold, nobody died. Nobody died. Um, I was driving back from there. I was driving back from there from, um, from when it happened. Um... I just drove past the church. As I drove past the church in Dudley, there's a blue cross on the front. I looked at the cross, and it was just 
it was simple as this. All my life, God's real. I was looking for God. I was looking for Jesus. I was enjoying being a thug, being, being in <laughs> organised crime, making a lot of money. We got married in Cuba on the beach. Where do you think that come from? We'd save hard, but you know. A lot, a lot of things like this, I had, had a life for Riley. But I drove past the church with a blue cross on. I looked and thought, oh my life, God's real. After saving a little girl's life. I went to sat in the house, burst into tears. Leah said to me, what are you crying for? I wasn't the crying type. I said, I don't know, I got a clue. I haven't got a Scooby-Doo. But this is what's just happened to me. I knew then I needed to go to church. We lived by the church in Dudley, right by it on the corner, up in Dudley, up South Street. And then, God's got ways of making of getting you into church. Some of you are here tonight. Some of you aren't getting captured tonight, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, God's got ways of getting you into church. For two years, I struggled. About a year and a half, I knew Jesus was real. I 100% knew. I thought, I'm not going to church. Church is wimps. I don't need nothing. I'm making loads of money. I've got two nice cars, nice house, fantastic job. I don't need anything. But let me tell you, God's got away. So anyway, this little girl comes into our life. It's sitting there now. There was six at a time. A pastor come through for the letterbox for a club in a six weeks holiday called Banana Club, which I went on to work at and called Bad Apple. And I should dress up as an apple. Believe it or believe it not. <laughs> but anyway. I thought, you know what, I'll take, I'll take my little girl to, to, to Banana Club so I can go to the gym and lamp somebody. You know, basically, and train. So I did, and then the first time I went to the church, it just struck me. The first time in my life, I walked through a door of anywhere, covered in tattoos, with a vest on, a pair of shorts on, because I'm going to the gym. And nobody was scared of me. Nobody was scared of me. And I was like, what? I was used to walking into anywhere, and everybody was like, whoa. Nobody was scared of me. I took her every day for the week, so I took her to the gym every day. I'm not lying to you. I took her to church so I could go to the gym. That's the truth. On the Friday, they said to me, come to church. It's on Sunday. Bring Mary out and get a prize for coming every day. Okay, fine. We'll come Sunday. Went Sunday. That was it. God got me in church. <laughs> he knew my soft spot is kids. Kids. Kids are my soft spot, you know. He knew by using the child, he's using the wrong word, using the wrong word, by asking the child to ask me, I'll go. So I went, come out, I said to Leah, I'm going to church next week. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> with, the, with the D and the H word, I'm not going to say. That's what she called me, anyway. I said, I am. So on the Sunday, I woke up, started getting dressed. So where are you going? So the church told you. So anyway, I went to church, took me out. Me was six. Well, me took me. Me walked me up the steps. <laughs> Imagine six year old and me uh, walking up the steps. So I'm a little bit scared. We went to church and Leah came. And Leah said, uh, 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 one week. First week I went, so this is my life. This is my life. I'm going to in church. And that was eight years ago. Leah says, I'll come here to support. So we all, we, both, we all started going and they become a worship singer in the church and I started doing things for the church. I want to say to all of you, you know, I want to, I want to cry out to all of you. I've got some very hard mates near right now. Some very hard lads who I know. The Cheese Rights, the Crazy Winsby, them in here. You know, knowing Jesus is not a weakness. Look at us. Look at us. People say to me now, oh, it's weak now in Jesus. Well, come down to the gym then, I'll spoil you. <laughs> I'm not joking, I'm being serious. Come down to the gym, I'll spoil you. I'm not weak. Come to church, man, I'll pray for you. Yeah. yeah. Don't make me weak. In fact, it makes me stronger than I ever was. You know, everybody's not a Christian in church. You know, it might be time for you to say, you know what? I've had a really pox day, upside down, inside out life. I'm always a giddy goo. What have I got to lose? You know, 
what have we got to lose? My wife always says to people, we say to me, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. That's all saft, I bother about that. What my wife always says is to him, when I die, if I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. You know? Because I'm going to go in the, in the ground, I'm going to go into the firelight of everybody else. If I'm right, I've gained everything. And that's the best way to look at it. You know what? When I got saved, I, I can't, like, like Andrew, I can't, I can't explain to you what happened. It's too much. It made me cry. I couldn't understand it. It made me cry. I, it, it, I couldn't laugh. I, I didn't know what to do, so I just cried. Maybe some of you lost turn tonight, you know? It's not a weakness. Trust me. How can it be a weakness when every single week, I'm on telling in front of 60.3 million people every Saturday night, I cannot be weak. My only last night, I'm praying with the world champion and African guys. I'm fine for anyone to see. And he's changing him on BT Sports. You know, it's not a weakness. Please, you know, even if you don't want to give your life to Jesus, and it's just a start, you think, you know, might do. You know, forget, forget about being the weakness. Just start there. Just start there. Just start there. You know, it's good to like say. My coming to Jesus was just after saving a little girl's life who's never alive today. Um, like a brother to her, I'm godfather to her two children. She's 22. She's happy and healthy. She was 40 at the time. I've got a fantastic life for this home. Mm. Mm. Well. So Andy was dying. You got yourself into a situation that led you to church then Mark I knocked on your door about June this time last year and uh, things were grim weren't they things were dark yeah um, mum hadn't oh yeah mum had passed away then hadn't she yeah uh, I, I just lost my mum yeah um, but that hadn't got anything. That I was very conscious of that from day one. The people would think I would end up in a church because my mum had gone. There was nothing to do with it whatsoever. All of the feelings I had inside started three months, about three to six months even, before my mum even became ill. And I didn't even know she was going to die. It was sudden. But... No, it, there was something missing in my life, you know. Um, I'd come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, I was always an atheist. My dad used to say to me, why don't you believe in God? I said, well, I said, let's put it like this. I said, there's a book there. I said, you put something in front of me that's concrete and I will believe it. Well, that something happened to me. Um, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Um, it was weird, I don't know. I mean, you know, but it changed my life. Um, totally changed my life. The baptism, as Andy said, is, is, is uh, your commitment to, to God for the rest of your life. And um, if it wasn't for quite a few people in this church... Andy and uh, Steve and all the people who know me, I would be dead now, definitely dead, absolutely, 100% dead. Uh, I'd even gone as far as to go into things like black magic and um, serious, serious stuff. I'd gone to the other extreme, if you know what I mean. Um, serious, serious stuff, you know, uh, how the hell I did that? I couldn't. If I'd have told my dad, he well, he'd probably chop my head off. Um, but you know, uh, that was it. You know, uh, and it was like three months. There was something there. Something was missing in my life, and I didn't know what it was. And I'd had a, I'd, I'd only ever been in a church once when I was seven. And by this point, I'm fifty years of age. You know, I'm the old man here. You know. Uh, uh, and I, I feel like it. <laughs> That's a compliment to you both, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I, um, 
I'm something fifty. <laughs> but you know, I, 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 there was something, and I thought, no, I walk up past the church. I walked up this road here. I wasn't drinking. No, I don't think I was drinking. I, I'd got to the point there where, with a drink, it was like I didn't want it anymore. I just got fed up of it, basically. It didn't do anything for me anymore. I, I knew I could sit there and drink, and it didn't. I didn't get the buzz that I got when I first started drinking. It's like when I had my first spliff. I'll never forget that. But the next one and the next one for however many years is never as good again as the first buzz. You're always chasing it. Waste of time. Waste of time. And then I came in here, and I don't really know what I come in here for, actually. I mean, <laughs> I could have come in for a loaf of bread. Or, you know. uh, I, 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 I just came in here, you know. Um, but Steve come to the house. When things were bad, I'd got a, a lunatic moved in next door to me. While all that was going on, my mum was dying, and... Um, he, he, the guy next door was knocking his wife about, burdling my house while I was at my mother's. Um, and he was addicted to mamba. And very soon, so was I. Um, and it's just as I'm sure a lot of you know, recently in the news, the seven people died, you know. The same as as many people died of many other different drugs, you know. But uh, I would say, of all the experiences I've had in all my life, that is the one that really frightened me uh, the most. I really did think I was going to die, and I didn't just dabble with it. I mean, I seriously, you know, when you've worked in a cafe in Amsterdam rolling spliffs, you know what you're doing, you know. Um, I'm not proud to say that, but, you know, I didn't want to turn down £70 pound a night, so that was it, you know. Uh, money was everything then. Money's nothing now. It's a good job because I ain't got none. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But I, c I can say I had a good time, yeah. Would I do it all again? Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. But what I would do again is walk in this building. Yeah, yeah absolutely walk in this building. And I know that what happened, I don't know what happened in my front room, but all I do know is there was somebody sat on my settee and I, I hadn't let nobody in the house. And I don't believe in ghosts, never in a million years, but there was somebody sat. I, I was sat in my mum's chair, which I don't do because I think it's disrespectful. And there was, I looked up, somebody on the settee in front of me and he said, follow me, follow me, follow me. That was all I heard once, just once. Me is not the best, but I heard what he said. That was what I said to Steve tonight when I come in. That was what he said to me, follow me. And I thought, why, where are you going? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I, I just didn't think any more of it at the time, but... Uh, I think a lot of bad things probably too much and it, something just changed in me and I I just knew that I'd found the right pathway at long last. It took me 50 years to find it, but I found it, you know. Um, I mean, it's a lot of addiction is used to cover the past, definitely. Um you know, uh, all sorts of things. For me, it was abuse and different things, but I ain't going to go into that. But, you know, it was abuse. Uh, um, and that was... I'm not going to use it as an excuse. No, I'm not going to use it as an excuse. I put the stuff into my body. Nobody else did. And I thank the Lord I'm here today. He's here with me every day. He talks to me. I get up in the morning. I say, good morning, Mum. Good morning, Dad. Out in the room. Bearing in mind I'm on my own. Well, there's the hamster. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, morning, Jesus. That's why I say. And I light a candle. 
on the table there, and that's it. And I am a very peaceful man now. Um, people who know me when I was younger, you know, a different man, don't know me. I'm going to say boo to a goose now. Thank you for everything that you did. Yeah. And Andy, wherever he is. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Bless you. Alan often says to me, thank you for giving me my son back. And I often tell him, I didn't give you your son back. Jesus gave you your son back. And uh, thanks for the thanks. But, you know, all we did was just share the love of Jesus. And uh, that's the only thing that's changed these boys' life. And uh, continue to change them. And uh, we want you to experience that same kind of feeling. So would you stand with me? Jay, I want you to pray. Would you, would you pray with the guys? Can we all stand? And uh, Jay's going to pray a prayer. Now, we, we ain't forcing anybody into anything. This is not what we're about. We want you to know the Jesus that these boys have found. And um, when you go out, there'll be some, there'll be some uh, Bibles for you to take, some books. Just take whatever you want. If you want to give it to somebody else, take some of that as well. You know, there's plenty there. We've got 100 odd. Uh, but we want you to know the fact that Jesus Christ is a life changer. And Jay's going to pray. Then we're going to sing one more song. And... Uh, some tea and coffee down there, some biscuits, so enjoy yourself, have a drink, have a chat with the boys. I'm sure they'll take some photos or whatever you want to do. I mean, they're all ugly, though, so you probably wouldn't want to stand next to them. Um, but anyway, we'll, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Jay, pray, pray with the guys, will you? Let's ask God to come um, into people. Just for a start, like I said to you, being a Christian is not a weakness. Some people are not Christians today. I'm not going to Bible bash you. I'll never buy a basher. I'll never tell you you've got to wear anything to come to church. All we want you to do is walk through that door and just give Jesus a chance. Okay? So if you want to bow your heads, as I pray, if you want to know Jesus, just raise your hand. If you're a Christian and you need to renew your faith and you've been doing something wrong, you ain't got to tell me, you've got to tell Jesus. If you want to share it with somebody, you can. First of all, you've got to share it with Jesus. Jesus has to come first. There's no other way. So I'm going to pray. If you want to know Jesus, or you want to renew your faith, or you want to take another step forward, raise your hand. Please bow your heads. Close your eyes as I pray. Because some people might feel a little embarrassed about raising their hand. If you want to know Jesus, just say these words after me. Jesus, will you forgive me for my sins against you? I want to forgive everybody who sinned against me too. Jesus, I want to know you. I want you to come into my life and make me new. Jesus, I know it's not going to be easy. It's going to be really difficult. But I know if I hold your hand, it's going to make it a lot easier. And then it gets a little more easier, then it gets a lot easier. As I pray, I'm going to say to you, it's not easy. But there's people in this church who will help you. So let's pray. Jesus, will you come into my life? Lead me to pastures near. Raise your hands if you want to know. If you want to know Jesus, raise your hands. Jesus, come to these people's lives and make them anew. Father, I'm not going to go on and on and on like some people do with the Saviour's Prayer. All I want you people to do is ask Jesus into your lives. Ask him to show you the love of Jesus. Do not be embarrassed. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Just ask Jesus into your life. Ask him into your heart. It's your heart where it matters. Ask Jesus into your heart. You've got to do it yourselves. Just pray. Jesus, will you come into my life and make me new? If you've prayed that prayer and you've raised your hands, come and see if you want to. 
If you've not yeah. prayed the prayer, you can still come and see us on the Sunday. There's no sign what says out there. If you're not a Christian, you can't come in. Get out of here. Listen, if you're not a Christian, you can come in any time you want. If you feel a little embarrassed tonight, most of you got my number, phone me, I'll come to your house and pray with you. Yeah. Father God, I ask you to show all these people love. Mm. Ask you to show and re- reveal yourself who you are. Mm. Holy Spirit, I ask you to descend upon this church now. Mm. Holy Spirit, descend upon this church. Yeah. Descend upon the people, descend upon the hearts. Father, if you can do it for us three, you can do it for anybody. Mm. Jesus, I love you mm. with all my heart. Mm. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.